Okay, well, so um, welcome to our roundtable on Russia looking for backward and forward. Um, this is part of the Maya Brain Residency Program, um, and uh, this residency program allows us to bring um, people from uh, all different kinds of cultural, political, um, historical significance, you know, uh, Russian, Russian scholars, artists, cultural figures, to campus for, um, for a residency. And then we usually have some kind of event organized around it. Um, I, I, um, I was about to thank Jeanne Vernola, our coordinator, but she just walked out the door to take care of something. So you see, she's, she's busy all the time. Um, in, in any case, I wanted to thank um, the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, the, the College of Arts and Humanities, um, and uh, of course, my colleagues in, in Russian um, and Russian studies and things Russian across the campus, and especially Jeanne Vernola, who's back here, so we, she can be thanked publicly. <laughs> to, uh, to, to Extraordinary um, organizer of this whole program, um, and uh, and of course um, Michael Brand, who is the who is our um, the, our donor of, of, of the, that makes this whole thing possible. Um, this year, when the faculty met to discuss um, whom to invite as our Mayabrin resident, um, we we thought about two things. Um, the first of which is the what appears to be sort of maybe not sudden, but craziness all around us in the entire world um, that we live in today with all sorts of emotions that I think many of us thought had been long ago worked through and dispatched that have returned in new and, um, and yet familiar manifestations. Um, in that context, Alexander Etkin's contention that Russia, having never gone through an official process of reconciliation with its traumatic history, is different from, as he puts it, post-catastrophic Europe, and, or even the United States, which he doesn't mention at all. Um, this, this idea seems really worth revisiting. Um, here in the United States, the debates about what to do about monuments to the Confederacy have taken on an urgency that's all too familiar um, to us who study the former Soviet Union. In Russia, Etkin writes, where millions <coughs> remain unburied, the repressed return as the undead. Um, in this sense, the topic of Russia looking backward and forward might be productive for understanding more than Russia, but also the process of understanding the past actively, not smoothing out, naturalizing, or domesticating the contradictions of the past, but rather looking at them closely in order to understand them. The second thing we thought about with respect to this year's residency was, of course, the centennial of the Bolshevik Re Revolution of October or November 1917. Um, all over the world, conferences are devoted to marking the passing of 100 years since the Russian Revolution. But how do we count? Um, what are the temporal boundaries of the Russian Revolution? Is it the Civil War? Is it the Stalin Revolution? Is the end marked only by the end of the Soviet Union itself? Um, so, so we propose looking at Russia today and the ways that it understands its own past. As we know, the Second World War, or Great Patriotic War, has become increasingly important in Putin's Russia. But how are other events being understood, naturalized, or domesticated, including the events of October 1917? To that end, we'd like to consider how popular culture, mass media, and social institutions have shaped and continue to shape widely shared visions of history and public discourse and politics, looking both backward to the Russian revolutions, all of them, um, and, and Soviet history, and forward to the upcoming 2018 elections. How have history and collective memory shifted since the collapse of the Soviet grand narrative of progress toward a bright future? How have access to historical archives and the revelations of Soviet crimes intersected with the myth of a glorious past in the collective memory of Vladimir Putin's Russia? Um, so the, the, um, the format that, we, that, that um, we're going to use here is that each, each of the panelists will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, um, more or less informally. Then we'll have an open discussion among panelists and, um, and audience. Um, and, uh, and we will have opening and concluding remarks from our honored guest, um, Lev Gurie, who I will now introduce. Um, so the person that we invited to make sense of, the per of, the, of these cursed questions is Lev Gurie, um, a Russian historian, writer, journalist, and radio host based in St. Petersburg, Russia. He received his PhD in history from Leningrad State University in 1987. He's authored many books about Russian history, is the four-time winner of the St. Petersburg Golden Pen Prize for Journalism, along with the Ansiforov Prize for his work on the city's history. His work focuses in particular on the history of St. Petersburg from revolutionary politics and political figures to the intrigues of the Romanov family to high culture. He's one of the founders of the St. Petersburg Classical School, where he teaches history, the author of the acclaimed St. Petersburg Guidebook, and the founder of the Le Lurier Culture and History Club. Um, what I think is particularly important to us is the way he connects the cultural and historical trends um, of Russian, across Russian history to our contemporary world. So I um, give the floor to Le Lurier. Mm -hmm. I should say that revolution is absent from Putin's ideological need. Can everyone hear him? Shall we use a microphone? Yeah. Okay. 
you have uh, spoken about national myths, about myths which are used by Russian government and uh, elite groups, but uh, the interesting thing is that they couldn't put revolution in this myth. There is no place in this myth. Because from one side, revolution from the point of view of Putin uh, is something uh, very bad, tragical, uh, change of the order. You know that uh, all the vets uh, between Soviet between Russia and the United States, uh, the Calvin relations, the spoiling relation began, began from the name color revolutions. Because uh, uh, Putin was suspicious of these color revolutions in Ukraine, in Georgia, in Kyrgyzia, and in Arab countries were infected by West. And as Nicholas I supposed that all revolutions of 1848 were organized from one staff here, one uh, center. So Putin supposed that everything, uh, everything, any revolution is organized more or less from the West. And yes, it is dangerous because he, I'm thinking, I think, is afraid of revolution in his own country, Russia. That's why 1917 is not a very good example. Because it's mean that the that, uh, revolution in Russia can happen. Yeah? It's from one point, of, it's uh, one side. Another side is that all those who are ruling Russia now are grandsons of revolution. Uh, Putin's father uh, was an unskilled worker, and his mother was a nurse in kindergarten. Uh, his uh, grandfather was a peasant, and uh, I'm assured and everybody else that during the old regime before 1970, Mr. Putin never can be <coughs> prime minister or president of Russia. So probably they understood that they are the centers of October Revolution. In another side, revolution isn't a part of their myth. This myth was uh, appeared, appeared first, first time in the 1920s and was named the change of landmarks. Mr. Ustryalov and other immigrants have announced that it is not very prominent what banner is on Kremlin. It is prominent that Bane is on Kremlin. You understand that any authority in Russia which makes Russia strong is, is a good thing. It prolongs the national tradition. So the idea that Lenin and especially Stalin prolonged the, la the line of emperors, which first was born, as it usually is, in immigration, not inside the country. Uh, slowly and gradually influenced the official ideology. Uh, it was the Stalin revolution uh, finished any and any part discussions inside the Communist Party. And it was, I should say, Stalin revolution which made, which prepared the new Russia. Because we can look at Russian history as on a black box. We have entering and we have exit. In entering, we have 85% of the population which were living in the rural parts of the country and 15% of those who are living in the cities. In 1991, we can see a country where 85% are living in cities and 15% in the rural country. Uh, we have taken, Bolsheviks have taken a country where 60% of the population were illiterate. Uh, in 1991, we have country where everybody can read and write and where the percent of those who receive university degrees has, is much more than in the majority of European countries. <coughs> I wouldn't 
speak about victims of collectivization or victims of 1937 and so on, but, but the results were this. Yeah? It was a, a, a very ugly, a very cruel uh, change of civilization, which took take millions of victims. <coughs> Uh, we can explain why, why it have happened in such tragical way. I think we have to, to look on not on European countries, because Russian history proves that it is not typical European country. We have to look on Eurasian countries. I think that a little more or less it is a history of Iran, Turkey, and Russia, but not history of. Uh, Germany, Poland, uh, and Finland and Russia. It is a different civilization and different history. Uh, very prominent is the um, uh, 1970s, because uh, Putin belonged to my generation, it's a generation of baby boomers, who were uh, young specialists, KGB officers, I don't know, military officers, in the time when that communist ideology uh, lost all its popularity. I haven't seen in my youth uh, a communist. I can see, I have seen a members of the Communist Party, but I couldn't see some poor guy or woman which supposed that there would be a communism in 1980s. Uh, so the absence of ideology has to be replaced by some another ideology. And this ideology was uh, moderate or not moderate nationalism. And uh, the idea that the golden era was before 1930. Yeah? So more or less orthodoxy, monarchy, and nationalism. It couldn't be nationalism or, or, or the way Russia for Russians, because Putin and all those who surrounded them, him, uh, you understand that Tatarstan and Chechnya is also Russian. Yeah? So they probably think so, but they could pronounce it. So it is a very, it's a very prominent thing to understand, and it is a big difference between autocracy in our days Russia and totalitarianism. Uh, this myth, Putin myths, it isn't something which um, which is, you know, total ideology as as fascism or communism. There are variations. You could openly tell, uh, I don't know, to my students in the school or to write in my column in newspaper that. Uh, no, I can write that I am against Putin, but I can write that I am against monarchy. So there is a different voice inside Russia, and it is a very prominent thing. But yes, Putin's Russia, Putin's ideology is a very conservative, and very counter-revolutional ideology. I should say in the end that the civil war is over, and that white defeat reds. It's it. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll uh, introduce Stephen Barnes. Um, he's an associate professor at, of history at George Mason University, a specialist in the history of the former Soviet Union. Um, his first book, Death and Redemption, The Gulag and the Shaping of Soviet, of Soviet Society, was published by Princeton University Press in 2011. It won two major prizes for works in European history. Professor Barnes has also worked with the National Park Service and the Gulag um, Museum in Param, Russia, as a historical consultant for a traveling museum exhibit on the history of the Gulag. Working with the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, um, Professor Barnes has built a website on the history of the Gulag. He's the founder and a co-blogger at the Russian History Blog. Um, and uh, uh, he's going to speak today, I think, about museums. <laughs> well, a number, a number of things. Uh, you know, so what I do really is, is you know, to study the history of one of the darker uh, stories of uh, the history of the Soviet Union and 
the form of the uh, gulag, the system of forced labor concentration camps, internally exiled people, uh, these kinds of things. What I want to talk about really is, is you know, as somebody who has studied that for much of the last 20 years, uh, I obviously pay a lot of attention to the way that these kinds of things are talked about uh, in Russia today. Uh, often at times I'm just honestly like looking for new stories and new sources and things like that. And, and uh, but, it, but it's made me, um, I think, sensitive to uh, the way that, that this history is handled uh, in Russia today. And, you know, I, I'd say, generally speaking, the, the, the point I want to make is that with respect to remembering the darker parts of the Soviet past, uh, contemporary Russia defies a, a simple categorization. Um, it's, it's, it's a more mixed picture than we might think. Oftentimes, uh, I think there's a tendency in the United States especially to, to focus heavily on a, on a picture of Putin as a, a kind of neo-Stalinist or, or at least a sort of a neo-Soviet leader uh, to focus uh, exclusively on uh, those uh, aspects of uh, Putin and contemporary Russia that uh, seek to blot out the dark pages of uh, the Soviet past. Um, but I think that's, that's too simple. Uh, there, there's something more going on. I mean, I have no love for Putin. I mean, I feel like I've spent the Latin, you know, most of the last two decades watching him attack one freedom after another, watching people that I uh, care about and whose work I care about uh, under pressure from the state, under pressure from elements in Russian society, under pressure from the Russian press and television and, and things like this. Um, you know, some might like to sort of simplistically tie that failure of historical memory in Russia uh, to uh, uh, all of these attacks on freedom, but, but it's more complicated than that. Many in society work very actively, and I would say very successfully, uh, to promote commemoration uh, of this history. Uh, though there are many others who also uh, attack those who are trying to remember these aspects of history. The Russian government is also a mixed picture. It's not as universally hostile to those memories as we might like to think, uh, but it is also uh, by no means living up to, uh, you know, what I think we would want to expect of it. Uh, so what I want to do is, is to just show you some of the things that are, are going on in Russia uh, in terms of, of remembering this kind of history. And, and, you know, I think I'll start with some social groups, uh, some, some, some public organizations uh, in Russia uh, that have devoted themselves to this story. Uh, there is the International Memorial Society, uh, located uh, in a number of cities actually around uh, Russia. Uh, I'll talk just for a moment about uh, the Moscow organization. Uh, in Moscow, the uh, International Memorial Society uh, collects an archive, uh, and has collected and, and preserves an archive of uh, first-person accounts of experiences in the Gulag and experiences with Soviet repression. Uh, a lot of this material is then used by historians and others to uh, um, tell these stories, to make sure that these things are not forgotten. Uh, they have a, a phenomenal and really a very interesting collection of artwork uh, that was completed by prisoners while they were in gulag camps. Uh, some, of, uh, some of it was completed by former prisoners after they left the camps. Um, all of these kinds of things, they're actively involved in publications. Uh, they have a big public event every year that's coming up later this month, always on October 30th, the Day of Memory of Victims of Repression. Uh, it's called uh, uh, The Return of the Names, Vazvarashin uh, Yimyon, where for, um, I think it's usually 10 or 12 hours, uh, they will read the names of people who were victims of Soviet terror, uh, just to make sure that we remember these names. This is done right near the Lubyanka, the notorious head of the KGB, our headquarters of the KGB, and today of the FSB, uh, where there is a stone from the Solovetsky camp that was brought there and placed there uh, in the 1980s uh, as a memorial. Um, there are other organizations like this. Memorial is just the one that I focused on. There's the Sakharov Center. Uh, there are local activists, local museums, uh, local memorials that individuals have put up and groups of people have put up uh, around Russia. Um, <coughs> The Memorial Society is also a very notable human rights organization uh, in Russia. Uh, and this, uh, as much as their devotion to uh, commemoration of uh, the Soviet past, 
This is what often runs them, I think, into trouble with uh, the Russian government and with Russian uh, activists today. I think it's also important to pay attention to the fact that there is very serious scholarship going on on this history uh, in Russia today. Scholars all over the country uh, writing local histories of uh, gulag camps, writing local histories of uh, repression. Uh, these kinds of books can be uh, readily found in bookstores, uh, in libraries, and, and things of this sort. Um, people do have wide access to archives, although some limitations, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, it's combined also, I think, problematically when you go into a bookstore with, with uh, stacks of, of whitewashed histories of, of the Soviet Union, of conspiracy theory histories, some of which, by the way, written by Americans, There's one American scholar in particular whose uh, books one can find in bookstores in Moscow that uh, make it out as if Stalin never uh, politically repressed anyone. Um, there is um, a um, movement, I guess is maybe the way to think of it, uh, underway now called Last Address, Paslitny Address. Uh, the journalist and publicist Sergei Parkominko started this uh, with a number of others uh, to put memorial plaques on buildings uh, commemorating people who uh, suffered uh, as a result of the terror. Uh, they try very hard to get society actively involved in this. They try to get permission from the people who live in the buildings uh, before placing these plaques and part this very process to create a public conversation. Uh, and to remember that it is people that live in the very building that you live in today uh, that suffered these things. Um, there is a strong social media presence uh, on memory of uh, the Gulag, memory of terror. This is just one Facebook group or Facebook page that you can find remembering the Gulag. Uh, there are many that I follow that day after day after day publish stories of individuals, publish uh, stories on uh, key uh, uh, commemorative dates, a lot of things this year, as you might imagine, with uh, much of the, the, the worst of the Great Terror coming in 1937. Uh, so a lot of 80th anniversary stories this year. Uh, the one that happens to be on this uh, screen capture is from the adoption on the July 5th of 1937 by the Politburo of uh, a decree aimed at uh, what they called members of the family of traitors to the motherland, basically going after and arresting people merely for the fact that their husbands or their fathers or their brothers or somebody like this uh, had been arrested. Uh, so there's a large social media presence. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, Facebook, of course, is just one of the many places that one can find this uh, kind of material. Now, the official government line is uh, problematic, uh, of course, in Russia. Uh, there's most definitely a de emphasis on these pages of history, but I don't think I would go so far as to say that there is denial uh, that it is something that took place. Uh, there are certainly uh, significantly fewer pages in history textbooks devoted to this kind of history. Um, but the Gulag Archipelago was made available in an edition uh, that could be used in schools. Um, it is not completely absent from textbooks, uh, but it tends to be subsumed in what you might think of as the good news story of Soviet history, and most particularly subsumed into the history of the Great Patriotic War, uh, which really is something of uh, a, a profound moment of faith uh, in Soviet history for uh, the current government uh, and for many in society. Um, this leads to things like the reappearance of statues of Stalin. Uh, this uh, a, a statue that uh, was put up in Yalta to commemorate the Yalta Conference. Uh, of course, as a historian, I say you can't talk about the Yalta Conference without talking about Stalin to erase him from that history would be just as wrong. Uh, but uh, statues aren't about memory, right? They're about commemoration and, and uh, putting up uh, statues. And this is not the only place that one can find that statues have reappeared now uh, of Stalin around uh, Russia uh, is itself uh, dramatically uh, uh, problematic. Uh, there's been an extension of secrecy uh, on, uh, on the period of secrecy on terror era documents held by the uh, former secret police. So we have, uh, uh, if, if you study the Gulag as I do, we have all of the administrative documents uh, from uh, the Gulag camps, uh, but individual files on uh, investigations and interrogations and things of this sort were subject to a 75-year secrecy uh, ban uh, on material uh, having to do with uh, individuals. 
uh, when this 75 year uh, time period sort of uh, you know was coming up for 1937 and 1938 suddenly uh, that period was extended uh, there's been a lot of pressure on organizations pressure on the International Memorial Society uh, periodically they uh, deal with um, um, attacks from the government uh, from the the press from television stations uh, which are themselves in Russia of course not at all uh, independent of the government um, the passage of uh, the law on foreign agents requiring any organization that receives money from external sources uh, outside of Russia uh, and engages in what is understood to be political activities are, are required to declare themselves to be foreign agents this term carrying all of the connotations that you might think of it um, the memorial headquarters was defaced uh, with graffiti uh, writing foreign agent on the side of it uh, after the adoption of this law um, so they, they you know all of these kinds of things are problematic the, the uh, federal penal service uh, proudly in many cases now traces its history directly to the Stalin era this uh, plaque which says you know the, the, this uh, is, is tracing the history of uh, a, a penal institution back to uh, 1937 uh, and it says you know this memorial plaque is established uh, as a sign of uh, respect and gratitude to the creators uh, of this system uh, there's a lot of ways in which I think one can talk about the Russian penal system today as a monument to the gulag but not of the kind that we might like uh, but rather it, that it continues a lot of the kinds of uh, um, processes one saw in the Soviet era. Uh, the, the geographic spread uh, looks very similar to these kinds of things. Um, the last thing I want to talk about just for a few minutes uh, is the story of uh, the Gulag Museum at Perm 36. Uh, I've had the fortune of working directly with people uh, from this museum on a traveling exhibit in the United States, on an online exhibit. Um, the background here is that Perm 36, the, the camp that is that was located in this uh, on this site dates back to the Stalin era. Uh, it very notoriously though held uh, members of the dissident and human rights movement uh, in the 1970s and 1980s uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was only closed in the very late 1980s uh, and a group of local activists uh, in Perm, uh, and this camp is located outside of Perm basically into the Ural Mountains, uh, went in and decided to try to preserve this place as a site of his historical memory. Um, there was always a, a fundamentally uh, problematic relationship between the fact that the state, the government continued to own the property, but they were granting the right to its use to this public organization uh, that created this museum devoted to recalling this history and, and one of the few uh, places that we can talk about that you can visit that's an actual site where uh, people were held, were held all the way back to the Stalin era. Well, they, they uh, you know, did a lot of work in restoring the camp uh, uh, to, to make it look like what it had once done. They, they engaged in a lot of international projects, educational projects. They had an annual uh, uh, festival uh, dedicated to discussions of human rights and, and music and, and, and things of this sort. Um, a few years ago, they started to run into problems. Um, not uh, an accident probably that this comes around the time that the troubles with Ukraine start. Uh, among the people that the museum uh, devotes their history to are Ukrainian nationalists from the 1970s and 1980s. This became very problematic in Russia. They were subject to some very scurrilous uh, television programming uh, from NTV and from uh, you know, uh, federal channels. Uh, there was a local organization uh, headed by a man named Sergei Kurganyan called uh, The Essence of Time uh, that you still find on their website just absolutely horrific things that they say about the people who ran this museum, that they were celebrating fascists and, and banderovtsi and, and these kinds of things. Uh, and so a few years ago there was basically a takeover of the museum uh, by local government officials. Uh, honestly, we still don't really know, I think, entirely the extent to which this was a, exclusively a local story and the extent to which Putin or the central government was involved. Uh, American press accounts certainly attribute these kinds of things to Putin, but they also have a tendency to attribute everything in Russia to Putin. Uh, and that is certainly potentially problematic. Um, so this is one of those stories that we tell that, uh, you know, really uh, makes us concerned, I think, about the state of, 
of memory in Russia. There's a lot of discussion that maybe this museum has turned away from talking about the horrors of the Stalin era and things of this sort, although if you look at their online website today, uh, it doesn't actually seem that much has changed in terms of the content of the museum. Um, but, it, but it raises problems for us. The last thing that I would say then, though, is that, you know, to present a picture of Russia today as only one in which the government is trying to suppress this kind of memory is to miss some other stories that are going on. The, there is a Gulag Museum in Moscow. Uh, it, uh, about um, a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago now, uh, moved to a new location, about nine times the amount of exhibition space uh, of their former location. Uh, the government spent money on this project. Uh, there it will be opening later this month. Sorry, this picture is really dark here. Let's try this one. Um, the Wall of Sorrow uh, will be officially dedicated in Moscow on the Garden Ring uh, on October 30th uh, this year. Uh, it's 30 meters wide. It's, it's going to be a fairly large installation. I, of course, have not had a chance to see it yet. Uh, but this was uh, you know, a, a federal competition to put up a memorial <coughs> dedicated to the victims of Soviet repression. So it's not a, a simple story. Uh, let me just conclude to say that you know, I think we have to be careful to, uh, not to think that proper historical memory always goes along with respect for democracy and human rights. Um, I happen to have studied the Gulag mostly in Kazakhstan. Uh, and I can tell you that Kazakhstan in many ways is exemplary when it comes to memory of the Gulag. They talk about it all the time. They have museums dedicated to it. The president talks about it, all of these kinds of things. And this is far from what one would want to talk about as a country that has respect for democracy and human rights. You can do the right thing in terms of historical memory, but it doesn't necessarily change the way that you behave politically. Anyway, let me just stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I, I'm going to introduce um, Corey Flintoff, who, um, whose voice you will probably recognize as soon as he starts speaking. Um, he's a former National Public Radio correspondent uh, who spent nearly 40 years as a radio journalist, serving most recently as NPR's correspondent in Moscow. Um, he covered the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan and Ukraine, the earthquake in Haiti, the revolution in Egypt, the revolution and civil war in Libya. Um, he spent four years in Moscow as the NPR bureau chief, where he reported as Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin cracked down on dissent, seized Crimea, and led Russia into war in eastern Ukraine. Um, and he, he's been following um, all of the things going on in Russia um, with a keen eye and participating in all sorts of different, um, different kinds of um, discussions about Russia recently and I think um, is, is today going to speak to us about um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to take uh, uh, advantage of my time to sort of look back at this anniversary, which actually is taking place on Monday. Uh, it, it'll be the 55th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you'll recall, or you will know from history, that that was a 13-day standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union over the presence of Russian medium-range ballistic missiles in Cuba. Um, what had happened, uh, well, first I should say I think it's an anniversary that's worth noting because there are a lot of constructive comparisons between the situation or various situations that we have today. Um, this crisis, of course, came in a, another time of heightened tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, there were, uh, the United States and Russia, or in the Soviet Union, were at odds over uh, the status of Berlin, for instance. Uh, Russia was angry and felt threatened by American Jupiter missiles that were stationed in Turkey and Italy. Of course, the American CIA had been behind uh, the failed uh, Bay of Pigs invasion just a year, year before, um, as well as some bizarre attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. So Castro, uh, who's, who's facing an existential threat here, asked Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev uh, for missiles to defend the island against what he very naturally expected would be another American attack. Khrushchev agreed. Um, he conducted an amazingly successful covert operation to bring missiles and, um, and, and Russian or Soviet troops uh, to Cuba. He got uh, these medium range ballistic missiles and more than 40,000 Russian troops to the island before American <laughs> intelligence was fully aware of it. Um, some of these Russian uh, troops came as advisors, you know, agricultural experts. And so forth, um, and they wore 
tropical shirts as a sign that they were civilians and uh, or tourists. Um, this 13-day crisis began when President John F. Kennedy demanded <coughs> the removal of these missiles and the troops. Uh, ultimately, he imposed naval blockade on Cuba, although the United States called it a quarantine because a blockade would have actually been a, a direct act of war. Um, the negotiations between Kennedy and Khrushchev were slow because this was before the time of the hotline that connected the two presidencies. Um, this was when they had to communicate by letters that were, then had to be translated, encrypted, uh, sent by wire, and then, uh, and then untrans or retranslated and read. Um, and I, I think actually that that may have been something that introduced a kind of deliberation into the process. The two leaders and their advisors were forced to think about the communications in, in over a long period of time. Um, during the negotiations, the two leaders lied to each other. Uh, Kennedy insisted that the United States had nothing to do with the Bay of Pigs invasion. Khrushchev insisted in the face of all the evidence that there were no missiles by Cuba. Uh, both sides blustered. They made threats. Uh, the American general, Curtis LeMay, uh, argued very aggressively uh, for a bo to bomb the missile sites in Cuba and then follow it up with a full-scale invasion of the island. Um, Kennedy said, it's very likely that that would succeed, except that Russia would retaliate at some other point in the world, and very likely in Berlin. So he was unwilling to go that way. Uh, many advisors in the Kremlin felt that having gone so far, and having been so successful, Soviet Union couldn't afford to back down. Fidel Castro, of course, was urging Khrushchev to use uh, nuclear weapons against the United States if the U.S. made a conventional weapons attack on Cuba. So there were actually moments during this crisis when individual military officers, and some of them were very far down the chain of command, had authority to launch their weapons, and in some cases, nuclear weapons. Um, an American U-2 spy plane, for instance, was shot down by an anti-aircraft missile from Cuba. Uh, a Soviet submarine was cornered by U.S. naval vessels, and they dropped uh, practice death charges on it, not to cause damage to the submarine, but to let the commanders know that they could, they could strike if, it was, if the submarine didn't surface. What they didn't know about that submarine is that it was armed with nuclear-tipped missiles, and that the three senior officers aboard it had authorization to fire at their own decision if they came under attack. And the story is that of the three officers aboard this submarine, two, including the, the commander, the captain, were in favor of launching their missiles. The third member, the third senior member, was a political officer, and he argued against it. And because they were not unanimous, they did not launch. They surfaced, which was actually a big humiliation for them. But it prevented what would certainly have been um, a very serious exchange, if not the beginning of the war. Um, U.S. reconnaissance photos showed that as the negotiations were going on, the Soviet uh, ballistic missiles were being made operational. So that added uh, a serious element of time to it. The more, as more missiles came online, more missiles were ready to launch. Um, the United States was in a worse negotiating position. These missiles were assessed to have uh, a striking distance as far as Washington, D.C. Uh, if there had been a, a nuclear exchange, millions of Americans all along the eastern seaboard and the Gulf Coast could have lost their lives. Ultimately, these two leaders realized that nuclear warfare would be a disaster for both sides. You know, Khrushchev famously said that if there's another war, the survivors will envy the dead. Um, the Soviets ultimately agreed to dismantle the missiles and ship them home. This deal was verified by UN inspectors, not on the island, because Fidel Castro refused to allow any inspectors on his island, but at sea. Um, so that was arguably the closest the world had ever come to a nuclear war. The war was uh, averted, I think, in part because of the personal characteristics of these two leaders. Um, when the crisis began, Khrushchev believed that Kennedy was weak, indecisive, inexperienced, 
Um, the view was reinforced by the fact that Kennedy didn't double down on the Bay of Pigs invasion. You know, he, he could have sent American troops, but he did not do that. Um, Kennedy believed that Khrushchev was aggressive and devious and absolutely not to be trusted. Um, but both these men had worldviews that extended far beyond themselves. Uh, they had a strong belief in the systems that they represented. You know, Kennedy <coughs> believed in American-style democracy and capitalism. Uh, Khrushchev was a committed communist. So each man believed that his country's system would eventually prevail on its merits. So they were able to take a longer view and look beyond the immediate crisis. You know, I, importantly, I think both of these men had personal experience of war. Kennedy, you know, fought in the South Pacific. He was wounded there. Khrushchev was a political commissar who traveled throughout uh, the Soviet Union during the war and survived the, the siege of Stalingrad. So both these men knew the awful cost of war, and especially, you know, what it did to civilian populations. So today, we find ourselves on the verge of potentially several other crises. Um, we have two leaders who are exchanging threats and insults, each side accusing the other and each side committing provocative acts. Um, it's not a perfect analogy with the Cuban Missile Crisis by any means, but because the, the, Cuban, the Cuban Missile Crisis could be resolved because the Soviets were able to withdraw their weapons uh, and take them home. But they didn't lose their weapons and they didn't lose their capacity to make nuclear war if they were threatened. Um, the United States could reciprocate simply by making a public promise not to invade Cuba again and privately agreeing to remove those Jupiter missiles in Turkey. In the case of North Korea, the situation is a lot more complicated. Uh, the U.S. doesn't want Kim Jong-un to, uh, to have nuclear weapons, uh, and giving up those weapons would be an existential threat to Kim and his family. And, you know, they only have to look to see what happened to uh, other leaders who gave up their nuclear weapons in other countries, Ukraine for one, uh, Muammar Gaddafi is often cited. Um, the two leaders in this case don't have direct military experience. Uh, they both really seem to admire uh, military trappings and military displays. Uh, Kim uses military parades as a way uh, to demonstrate his power to his, his domestic uh, uh, population and also to his neighbors. Uh, he fires these missiles and tests bombs, even though that he knows that those tests will bring uh, international reproaches and, and, and even tighter sanctions against the country. President Trump likes military displays as well. You know, he was reportedly so impressed by that military show in Paris on Bastille Day that he's, uh, he's uh, proposing to have a similar production in Washington next Independence Day. Um, more ominously, he's employed the same kind of bellicose language that Kim uses. You know, he threatens to rain fire and fury on, on North Korea or to totally destroy it. Neither Trump nor Kim appears to be steady by a belief in a value system as, as Kennedy believed in democracy or Khrushchev believed in communism. You know, in leaders who believe in ideas that are bigger than, than themselves, you know, and ideas that, that profess to benefit all of mankind tend to be capable of strategic patience. Um, the standoff in North Korea is sort of the crisis du jour right now, uh, but there's other flashpoints around the world. For instance, President Trump has said that he will uh, not certify that uh, Iran is in compliance with the nuclear agreement. Um, that's an act that could lead Iran to revive its nuclear weapons program. Um, it would certainly put us at cross purposes with our allies in Europe and also with Russia and China. Um, if there were a crisis in the Strait of Hormuz, for instance, you know, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, could we believe that the leaders on both sides would be responsible and restrained? Um, you know, for that matter, we have, of course, the growing hostility between Russia and the United States. You know. Uh, potential flashpoints there, you know, all the way from Syria to Ukraine and the Baltics. Uh, President Putin, like President Trump, he's a man without direct military experience. He's a man who likes to appear in military uniform and preside over these impressive military parades. Um, and like Trump, he seems to be a man without any strong ideology, you know, other than the preservation of his system. Uh, 
uh, and the desire to restore the, the prestige of the Soviet Empire. Now, he's a man who's shown that he's willing to take uh, risks for short-term tactical gain, uh, but it's not clear whether he has the capacity to take the long view uh, if Russia and the United States were to find themselves in a military crisis. Um, fortunately, it appears to me that right now, at least, both Trump and Putin have fairly sound military advisors who can give them realistic assessments about the limitations of their military power. But, you know, when leaders have almost unlimited authority, uh, even good advice isn't necessarily restraint. <coughs> President Kennedy was assassinated a little more than a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis ended, so it's not clear whether he and Khrushchev would have been able to somehow extend the experience that they'd had with the crisis uh, in ways that could have improved relations even further. After uh, President Kennedy's funeral, his wife Jacqueline Kennedy wrote to Khrushchev in response to the Soviet leader's message of condolences. And she spoke of the, the crisis and how the characters of these two men helped them to find a resolution. And, and here's what she wrote. You and he were adversaries, but you were allied in the determination that the world should not be blown up. You respected each other and could deal with each other. I know that President Johnson will make every effort to establish the same relationship with you. The danger which troubled my husband was that war might be started not so much by the big men by the little ones. When big men know the needs of, for self-control and restraint, little men are sometimes moved more by fear and pride. If only in the future the big men can continue to make the little ones sit down and talk before they start to fight. That was the heart of Jacqueline Kennedy's message to Khrushchev. Uh, the Soviet leader, of course, himself was ousted from power within a year or so after that. And it was in part because uh, others in the Kremlin believed that he played a very weak hand in Cuba during the crisis. I hope that we still have <coughs> big men and women in our government and in the hostile uh, governments that we have to deal with. And I hope we have men and women who have the courage to advocate for restraint and keep those little men from going to war. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I'll let you introduce Sarah Oates. Um, Sarah Oates is a professor and senior scholar at the Merrill School of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Um, her field is political communication and democratization. Um, one of the major themes of her work is how the traditional media and the internet can support or subvert democracy, a theme that she's explored in different contexts, including Russia, the United States, and the United Kingdom. One of her most recent books <coughs> is called Revolution Stalled, the Political Limits of the Internet in, post -Soviet, in the Post-Soviet Sphere, um, which came out in 2013. Um, and her current work examines how political messages travel through media ecosystems, analyzing why some stories gain more attention than others from audiences. Um, this includes work on how Donald Trump gained huge public um, attention via the media in recent elections. And before becoming a scholar, Professor Oates was a print journalist. Thank you for that, and thank you for inviting me. I have to say, you guys have the best food on campus. Um, and, and But more importantly, it's, it's just great to see how the Maya Brin program brings people together across disciplines. Um, and that's, that's a great thing and, and I think a big contribution to, to the university. Um, before I, I get too far, I'm gonna take out my timer, typical academic, go on for hours, but please <laughs> warn me at 10 minutes and then just haul me off stage at 15. And <laughs> take me out and like the Bolsheviks have me shot. I think that'll, be, that'll be fine. Um, I also think it's interesting to note about the Brin family that, of course, Maya Brin's son, Sergei, is a co-founder of Google. And I think it's, it's kind of interesting that today I'm going to talk a little bit about information heights and why we find ourselves in this, this perfect storm, right? In many ways, Russian propaganda is, is recognizable to us, particularly to me. I just calculated that I was born um, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, but before Kennedy was assassinated. So, you know, it's kind of defining a generation in, in a way. And I grew up in a time of, of sort of vaguely knowing the Soviet Union was a bad thing. That's, and I grew up in a very liberal intellectual household, um, but you didn't hear good things about Russians. And being a difficult teenager, I decided that I would then, you know, that there was some kind of conspiracy, you know, what's this Russia place? 
that I would learn Russian when I went to Yale, which was a terrible mistake because it turns out I'm not very good in linguistics and Russian is hard. But uh, aside from that, um, it was an amazing and magical thing because Russia is, of course, I think the key to understanding everything. Mm -hmm. I think Russia is um, my personal Narnia, this, this amazing place where crazy and wonderful and fantastical things happen that then make you reflect on your own life and come to these realizations about who you really are. Um, so with that very kind of um, incredibly unrealistic view of life, I became a journalist, and I was a journalist for about nine years before um, I became a recovering journalist, and uh, went to go get a, a PhD. So it's nice to know that other journalists and PhD people also feel this. And um, so, so what, what does what does the scaremongering and what we would, would uh, recognize and understand as, as Soviet propaganda have to do with where we find ourselves today in Trump's America? So I have a couple of points to make. And the first one is, wow, Americans really scare easily. We're all freaked out about Russian propaganda. Those, those incredibly clever people in the Kremlin are manipulating us. And, and somewhere there's some very happy people in the Kremlin who are Xeroxing all these New York Times articles and taking them to their boss and asking for a raise <laughs> to say, wow, I, I'm doing great. So um, my sort of mission in life then is to say, well, let's, let's measure the amount and type of uh, Russian propaganda. And fortunately, I've spent 25 years doing this, so I feel well positioned to do a lot of content analysis. Although content analysis has changed a great deal since when I was a bright-eyed PhD student without gray hair, um, now chemically without gray hair, but really without gray hair, um, and, and, and I was going through, does everyone remember FIBIS? I know you remember FIBIS, the Foreign Broadcast Information Service, and highlighting words, and then counting them, and putting them on charts. Well, we can't do that anymore. There's way, way too much content. I then graduated onto, oh my god, um, coding broadcasts, Russian TV broadcasts, spent about a year watching with headphones in, writing down how many times they mentioned the communists, and doing a couple of books about that. So where, how, oh, oh, so, so where do we find ourselves now? A couple of years ago, I stumbled on some, well, I actually knew these scholars, but I didn't know their work as well as I should have, uh, Laura Roselle's work on strategic narrative. So Laura Roselle, who teaches at Elon, and also um, went to Emory University, as I did, uh, for my grad work, um, she talks about strategic narrative as the stories that states tell about themselves. So she's not the only scholar. There's um, uh, uh, Ben Laughlin and Alistair Miskimmon and others, and they've written some really interesting books about this. So I thought, aha, aha, strategic narrative. That will be the answer. I will define Russian strategic narrative. It also reminds me of a phone call I got from some other scholars who are breaking in on this whole Russian media thing. So I get a lot of those phone calls recently. Like, so, so Professor Ellis, tell us, how do we know what the Kremlin wants the media to say? I'm like, turn on Pyramid Canal. <laughs> there you go, they're not subtle. So I've been looking at uh, Russian television uh, to, to try to define, you know, what's, what's Putin's narrative? So we all kind of know it, right? We kind of know it. NATO, NATO is evil, Novaya uh, Russia, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a great Russian, um, uh, nation that needs to rise, the West are against us, Crimea is ours, there's no war in Crimea, uh, in, Ukraine, in Ukraine, we were just helping out. Um, so I've been, been, I've teamed up with, in the, in the spirit of, of Sir Gabrin, I've been teaming up with computer scientists, they're using computational linguistics, I'm doing my traditional coding, and we're trying to come up with some way to say, okay, NATO will destroy us. Let's look at how the stories that Russia tells within that narrative to project its view of the world. So this, this work, actually, we, we've now developed an app that takes human coders and blends them with computational linguistics. So it's all very exciting and somewhat terrifying. But in the end, it kind of all comes back to, and I know everyone in this who does area studies would be happy to hear this. It comes back to understanding why we tell the stories and how we tell the stories of who we are. And um, Stephen's talk really made me think about the fact that there's history and then there's the stories we tell about ourselves. And they don't always 
they're all they're never the same thing, but but they're the stories of who we want to be and how we project ourselves. And so I it, it does remind me that a deeper understanding of history would lead me to a deeper understanding of strategic narrative. So as usual, when I'm sitting on panels, it's it's really great to, to hear this stuff and reflect about it. So I also think, and not just because I teach in a journalism college and because I am an ex-journalist, um, but I also want to talk about not the Russians, but the Americans. So how have we gotten to a point where we're genuinely concerned that sponsored advertising and fake accounts on social media uh, may have tipped the balance of the vote in certain critical areas? And we don't yet know if that happened. Should we be extraordinarily concerned about it? I think so, yes, because I think information war, hybrid war, as it's called, where sometimes you send in the troops, sometimes you use information, um, disinformation, that kind of war. This is how war is waged in the 21st century. So if you ignore the information warfare, you're, you're really leaving yourself vulnerable uh, to that kind of threat. And I, I'm sure Corey Flintoff will agree with this, that. Um, there has been a long, deep crisis in American media. And this mostly relates to the economic issues and problems. So already in financial disarray at the beginning of the internet era, um, the, the, the logics of the online news system hollowed out American newsrooms. And it's been a, first a slow trickle and then pretty much a collapse of the professional newsroom. And why that matters, that we have so far fewer robust media organizations and, and many, many fewer full-time working professional journalists is because we don't have a guild, we don't have a bar association, we don't have a state media. We have NPR and we love it, but that's not the point. It's not some huge, as, as you will attest, it just doesn't get huge handouts from the federal government despite what they say on InfoWars. That's not how it works. Um, the way that, that American media or, or, or American journalism is nurtured and perpetuated is through individual newsrooms. And those newsrooms have withered away, much like the state never did in Russia. But um, the, the sort of the heart of American journalism is, is really under attack. And so that's the perfect storm, right? You have a system in which American journalism is underfunded and outgunned by state media systems. And America's weird. We are one of the, we're really the only large powerful nation that does not have a state media sector. And I know you're sitting in the audience going, Sarah, it's, it's probably good we don't have a state media sector just right now. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, it means there's a real dearth of funding and investment that is not now being replaced by information companies. So when you have, as a recent Pew uh, survey suggested, when 40% of Trump voters rely on Fox News only, really, as an information source, and really aren't interested in looking at what we would consider the more traditional mainstream news sources. Fox is fairly mainstream amongst the other choices of Breitbart, InfoWars, things like that. But Clinton voters, meanwhile, aren't really relying on one source, but are gathering information from a range of sources. Two really different groups of people and if you have people who aren't engaged with what we would call traditional mainstream journalism, they're very vulnerable to say, oh, RT, that's just another information source. Sputnik, well, that's a state information agency. They have the interest of informing the citizen at heart. No, they do not. They are propaganda. And I think those kinds of distinctions are making things very difficult. Um, so I think that when you think about the, the, the joint problem of a lack of investment in journalism, journalism, American journalism really being underfunded and outgunned, an audience that's disengaging to a degree, I do think we have a crisis. And I'm going to point the finger, and I, and I apologize to Sergey Brin about this, I am going to point the finger at um, the large uh, internet service providers, Google, Facebook, Twitter. I think it's time that they took some responsibility for this. And we're, we're seeing them getting pushed. And right now, it's a public relations exercise. But I think ultimately, you don't have a democracy without a robust media. Only 13% of the world's population, one three, 13% live in, in a country with a free media. Think about that. And it's getting worse over time. So um, yes, I think we should be concerned about the red threat. And I, I think we should be concerned, and, and as 
as um, citizens about being targets of foreign propaganda. But I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I will, I will leave it at that. Um, and our, our last panelist is Sergei Ushakin. Um, do you want to switch sure. over to here? Yeah. And I guess we can open up this. Um, so Sergei Ushakin is a professor of Slavic languages and anthropology at Princeton. Um, his work focuses on practices of cultural production and consumption, in particular on cultural recycling and retrofitting, including aphasia, nostalgia, pastiche, and re reconstructions and imitations in contemporary Russian culture. Um, his, published work, his published work includes this 2011 book, The Patriotism of Despair, Nation, War, and Loss in Russia, which was published um, uh, by Cornell. Um, as well as numerous co-edited volumes, actually quite a lot of co-edited volumes on a really wide range of topics, um, including emotion, trauma, laughter, political theory, and gender. Um, his current research includes work on the intellectual legacy of Russian radical modernism of the 1920s, um, including um, a recently a recently published three-volume anthology um, published in Russian um, called The Formal Method. Um, and uh, he's also interested in contemporary post-colonial theories and how they can shed light on cultural development in post-Soviet states. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, I want to just shift a bit um, um, the focus and uh, the scale and um, uh, scope of our discussion from Putin and Kremlin and the U.S. Uh, to sort of down-to-earth uh, uh, popular culture. I'm an anthropologist by training, so I'm interested in understanding how people on the ground actually perceive, understand, sort of process, and kind of spit out uh, all these big ideas, uh, conflicts, and, and stories. So what I want to talk about today is a model of a relationship between uh, universal and local identities, which the October Revolution offered, which were um, uh, actively dismantled during uh, the period of late socialism and post-socialism. To put, put it directly, what I want to focus on is a particular side of nationalism that I noticed um, uh, initially during my field work in Belarus and Kyrgyzstan, where sort of I, I've been working for the last what, maybe um, um, seven, eight years. Um, and um, across the post-Soviet region, it is hard not to notice the palpable um, return of the romantic fascination with the primitive and the archaic. And when you see it from the point of view of this country, so the Russia becomes less and less specific than in this respect. So you see uh, that most uh, of post-Soviet countries are doing that. So this pro the process of looking back, at least uh, was talking about in the very beginning, um, has a very particular and overdetermined goal, uh, overdetermined target. They're all looking for the golden path, as, uh, as Lev mentioned too. So in Bishkek, for instance, there is an interesting revival of the stylistics and rhetoric of nomadism which goes hand in hand, conveniently, with the revival of clan-based forms of social and political organization. Like some of you might have followed, uh, the, might follow this. Um, um, and they just had them uh, last summer, I think, last summer. They had another sort of um, uh, rendition of the so-called uh, games of nomads, and they had sort of one thousand of Camus players sort of performing this sort of march of nomads. So like you get this kind of. Uh, let's bring back like everything that we don't actually remember, but sort of that would be easily appropriated. <laughs> In Minsk, uh, where I work, uh, there are multiple manifestations of the enchantment with past forms of belonging and connectedness, which uh, are reanimated to generate some effective attachments. For instance, I'm working now with a contemporary photographer who recently finished a big, uh, massive photo project on paganism um, in Belarusian Palestine, so to, in the borderland <laughs> territory, basically reinventing rituals of somewhat Gothic irrationality. And as I said, the same trend could be easily traced in Russia as well, and I'll be talking about it. Uh, in a minute. So I didn't want to dismiss this trend uh, just as a post-Soviet tradition of the Soviet-style pochery, just, um, I don't even know how to translate it, some kind of organic nationalism, I guess, um, feeling for the soil, or some kind of primordial tribal, ethnic tribalism. I think the situation is much more complex, and partly, as before, these forms of ethnic belonging are a critique of Soviet-style modernization. What makes this critique of Soviet modernity interesting, though, uh, especially in these um, uh, locations, is that its very anti-Soviet character makes uh, irrelevant the very idea of modernity. Right? So we have imagined communities that are imagined by conservatives. Of course, this irrelevance is overdetermined sociolo sociologically or rather historically. In many cases, Soviet modernity is the only type of modernity that these places had. And I want to show how this tendency appears um, in a symptomatic film. It's called um, um, Angels of the Revolution. Um, it was done by Alexei Fedorchenko. 
a film director from Yekaterinburg. Um, uh, the film came out in 2015. Um, it didn't do that well uh, money-wise, but it, it was really critically acclaimed, partly because of the statue of um, uh, the, the uh, film director. Before The Angels, uh, Fedorchenko was known primarily, primarily for his two cin cinematographic provocations. One was his documentary called Kerva in the Lune, first um, on the moon, in the moon? Yeah, first, yeah, first there, right. Uh, that narrated a story about a trip to the moon um, uh, that took place in the early, early Soviet period. So it, the trip obviously didn't happen, but the film is presented as a sort of seemingly authentic archival chronicle. So the premises that sort of they, they found this, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they found this archive of the chronicle that kind of demonstrates um, this the story. And until well, you actually you watch it. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's really worth it. Like you, you can't even tell that it's it's basically fake fake news, right of sorts. Uh, the other one was his film Afsyanki. It, um, it it's available here in the U.S. as um, uh, Silent Souls, and it is about invented funeral uh, funeral customs of the really existing ethnic group of Mary um, in um, in the Russian North. And uh, it's actually interesting. Some re reviewers, especially in the U.S., took it for for for, for real. So like, they, yeah, that's what happened. Even though like no, it, it, it didn't. It never was. Uh, so The Angels of 2015 is an amalgamation of these two films, the approaches. It is about a trip that never took place to really existing ethnic groups, right? So what makes Angels of the Revolution so interesting is that the issue of ethno-nationalism is taken up not by your usual garden variety nationalist, but by a skillful and ostensibly postmodern cultural producer, right? The plot of the film could be reduced to this. In 1934, um, an Agit Brigada, so Agitation Brigade, I guess, um, of Russian avant-garde artists uh, goes to the remote northern region to convince local hunting mans, it's really up north, uh, hunting uh, its people to become friendly with the Soviet uh, power. Fedorchenko insists uh, multiple times in his interviews that the film is based on real events and real characters. Everything we see on the screen happened in real life, he, told, he tells us. But, and I want to emphasize it, not in the same place and not to the same people. So in other words, like we have here a very intricate montage. Yes, separately each segment, each move is true. It just never happened sort of together as a coherent story. Speaking about strategic narratives, so like, so <laughs> he creates the strategic narrative by montaging all these tiny bits of truth into sort of largely <laughs> false story. So the two-hour film is roughly divided into two main um, parts. The first one is about cruelty, meaninglessness, and profound violence of Russian avant-garde artists in particular, and the Russian avant-garde in general. In a sense, Dorchenko offers a cinematic illustration for the familiar reading of the Russian avant-garde by Boris Groys, who pointed out a parallel between the radicalism of uh, avant-garde um, aesthetics and the radicalism of Stalinist politics. For about an hour or so in the film, we see a bunch of really strange, kind of bizarre even people who fantasize, usually in empty rooms, about, for instance, creating, creating a symphony uh, of factory sirens, or we see how they stage dance performances of hairbrushes and combs, or how they create a monument to Judah, the first real iconoclast ever. We deserve to be seen as the best in the country, says in the film a character who looks very, very similar to Sergei Eisenstein. And that's another interesting thing. Of course, like, sort of, they're all prototypical, but they all have different names. So like sort of, names that tell you nothing, like Polina, Ivan, Nikolai, and so on. But like from the film, you could tell that sort of the references are clear. And I'll show you uh, some um, uh, clips in a minute. So Fedorshin allocates this group in a strange space of detachment and disconnect. They're devoid of any meaningful context, and empty rooms are not um, by accident there. There are no artistic rivals uh, with alternative aesthetics uh, views whom they could challenge, right, or who, uh, who could challenge them. There is no political pressure from the party of Bolsheviks. Because of this historical vacuum, um, Russian avant-garde emerges in, as, a, as a basically a group of megalomaniacs who colonized the whole country from Vladivostok to Moscow, from Moscow to Sviyarsk with their crazy projects. So it is precisely this group that goes to Kazim, it's a village in the north, and that's a real sort of um, um, place, to convince the natives to become Soviet. In the north, uh, we see a condensed repetition of the first part, that's the second part of the movie. The artists put up a show of suprematist paintings, um, showing black and red squares, I'll show you in a minute, to the locals. They involve, uh, involve local kids in staging an absurdist performance of a play about talking raccoons. 
Um, and again, it's kind of, really it's kind of harms, but uh, for, um, like, but uh, displaced into the animal kingdom. They even managed to force the naked women to stitch together an endless number of fish and animal skins uh, to produce a huge hot air balloon. Uh, the balloon was supposed to take them higher to the clouds so that uh, they could see themselves that there are no gods and no spirits. And I want to show you sort of six minutes. It's a, it's a, I did some violence to, to uh, his own structure. It's a montage of uh, three, three main scenes um, so that you could have uh, some idea. And I think, Turn on the lights. I'll try to translate. No, you don't need really the translation, but I'll, I'll, I'll do some. We don't need wings to fly. And then it's a little separate. Stop. Yes, stop. Yeah. Stop! Did you have a they just kind of about this trip to Kazim and sort of they're talking about like whether well, the, the other guy would go the the only way we could sort of get some accustomed to to art uh, and to the Soviet power is by art. What it uh, refers to is the shooting, uh, shoot, uh, shooting of um, a film in Mexico by um, Eisenstein. Right, so there's a blend, and you'll see later on uh, a blend of a real uh, film from uh, Viva, uh, Mexico um, by Eisenstein and sort of the, the film that he's making. I refuse to, to, to film this um, scene of um, uh, punishment. It's just ridiculous. Don Pedro, ¿por qué se dispara la cabeza pro? Te voy a dar la Why would you want to make it fake? Um, I'll give it the real for people. Ayer, un tribunal militar condena a muerte a tres desertores. We have todos three de todos soldiers who deserted uh, who were uh, condemned to uh, the solo punishment. Como un gran they don't die anyway. So this way they could sort of serve um, uh, to, uh, for the purpose of the high art. And that's a real sort of um, uh, clip from uh, Eisenstein's film. Come on, man. 
The sign says they exhibit a supremacist on painting. That looks like your wife. We, we, did, we dedicate this film and our music to this um, uh, cultural camps that we created here. And the sign says, glory to the genius of, uh, of arts. They filmed, uh, they shot while there, while being there. The sign says Narkom Nebo, which means the People's Commissariat of, of the Sky. Okay. So that's the um, uh, the Hadar balloon that they were uh, creating. Okay. Switching on the lights back Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, Fedorchenko contrasts this um, avant-gardist desire to conquer the sky by depicting the down to earth life of the locals. Rooted in their land, they worship their rocks, streams, islands, and trees. So for the avant-garde artists, nature is rarely more than a uh, backdrop for their artistic escapades. For the nor northern people, nature is a major condition of their own possibility. Detached and disconnected from the evils of modernity and progress, these people live their angelic life, uh, lives wandering in space, and they are real angels of, of the revolution. So clearly, this dialogue, uh, the dialogue of these two worldviews, the aerial, sky-oriented, uh, and the earthy, would be hard to sustain. And the um, uh, film of the story, the, the, the interaction ends um, exactly as you could imagine. The locals, um, alarmed by the constantly expanding intrusion of uh, the Agit Brigada into their sacred and profane lives, first perform uh, a shamanic ritual that you've, you've seen, and I cut it so that you didn't see the slaughter of the animal and so on, and then they go and kill the Agit Brigada completely. Um, so, a revenge followed very quickly. All locals who did not manage to escape earlier were killed by a punishing squad of the Red Army. So to see how the film is built as a series of symbolic equations. First, the revolution is reduced to the cultural revolution, which in turn is presented as a conflict of different visions of culture. Of course, the symbolic equations are strategically constructed. In one of his interviews, Fedorchenko explains that the plot of the film was not working out as long as he relied only on documents. And there was a real sort of um, um, uprising in, um, in Kazim. Kazim, as he put it, I quote, it got much better when I decided to link the rebellion with the end of the Russian avant-garde, which took place around the same time in the middle of 1930s. In other words, the document-based film becomes a mockumentary. So yes, um, the film is indeed a carefully and artistically choreographed story about the Huntingtonian clash of civilizations, 
but has a peculiar Zdanovian undertone to it. Ruthless and ruthless, formalist cosmopolites poison and destroy a centuries-old, tradition-bound, nature-immersed ethnic culture. In one of his interviews, Sidorshenko explained, I quote, the flip side of progress is the destruction of small cultures, unichtajenia malik kultur. They could exist only when they have a chance to isolate themselves, abosobitsa. Civilization and globalization work in a direction that is opposite to this. Civilization and globalization force connectivity. Our film is not just about our country, it is about relations between any empire and its colonies. So it is hard not for me not to see, um, as politically conservative, the celebration of romantic nationalism of soil and blood of isolated cultures. Even more dangerous, I think, is the routine dismissal of any form of connectedness that are not reducible to the self-isolating ties of kinship and tradition. Dorshinska's angel, um, Angels is a post-utopian conception <coughs> of the world and history in which the only viable forms of solidarity are the ones that come with your birth. So uh, we see in Fedorchenko's film uh, the replay or a replay of the same basic matrix that we could trace across the post-Soviet world, in which nationalism of blood and, and tradition is juxtaposed to amorphous, wandering identities that are divorced from any stabilizing localization. So we have again like rooted versus rootless. What we are to make, um, um, what are we to make out of this postmodern and post-Soviet fascination with nationalism? Out of this conflict between the cultures of belonging and the cultures of detachment. As I try to suggest, at least to some extent, this constantly repeated binary could be seen as a byproduct of unprocessed and quickly ejected experience of radical modernity that was unleashed by the revolution. The solidarity of class, basically the only form of universal belonging, internationalism, the Soviet modernity was interested in forging and promoting, was hollowed out and completely discredited by the end of the Soviet period. Yet other forms of universality did not make themselves easily available. If Fedorchenko's, if Fedorchenko's film is any indication of a larger trend, then I think we should worry about his angry enthusiasm. His attempts to read Russian avant-garde only as an archive of violence and misuse of power does create a useful background for his embrace of romantic nationalism. Yet this reading of nationalism as an isolate, isolated, self-absorbed form of community reveals again and again the phantasmatic nature of the angelic life that it celebrates, possible and achievable only on screen. Also, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I can I will open up the floor for questions and um, including questions from panelists to each other. I think um, if anyone wants to um, wants to address uh, someone else on the panel, that would be great. Um, I think I'll open up to any any of the people who are here. And any question to any panelist um, on, on these different, very, very different topics. I think that we've had all completely different approaches to this, to the question of Russia today, Russia in the past, and how Russia deals with its past, um, and how America deals with Russia's past. Um, I'll kick off, actually, sure. just because the first speaker said something so provocative and interesting. Did, did I misunderstand you, or did you say that the whites won? Yes. Okay. At some point, I, I, I want more on this. I don't know if you want to collect a few questions, but I was very, I would well, like to hear more. I do enjoy the white movement was a strong authoritarian power, mm -hmm. orthodox religion, national you know. So Putin... Ah, can say console, the yes. whites win. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And reds were international, cosmopolitan, uh, they were against capitalism, Putin is uh, on the side of the private property, so... Well, for his friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> the civil war is over, and Mr. Dinik and Kalchak won. Well, maybe, maybe I'll take a follow-up question. Uh, <coughs> Michel Kalch from the University of Maryland. Uh, uh, so, as far as, as far as what you were saying, the whites have won, uh, what would, like, when did that happen? They've won by when? Are you saying they have won by 1930s or by 2000s? They, they, like when was that yeah. point when they have won? They, won? It was a long war, yeah. Mm -hmm. It prolonged 80 years. Mm -hmm. So there were, it was a slow progress for the white idea. It was an example. But it's toasted, huh? toasted, 
The words of Stalin weren't he drink for Russian mm -hmm. nation, yeah? Yeah, yeah the toast. toast. For the great, for the great yeah. Russian people. It was a very prominent uh, change, yeah, of all ideological direction. The murder of the communists during the uh, 30s, because the communists were the main victims of the great purges. So in a way, it was anti-communist purges. Then, uh, 40s, and flourishing of the Stalin nationalism. And then I can see it in the 70s especially. I should say that this Pikul line. This line of Dribenshit. You understand? These, those who was writing about country house. The idea that the collectivization was wrong. And the idea that religion have to return back. So Putin and Ivanov and a lot of these guys. Uh, Sergei Ivanov, who was a chief of the president of the administration, have told that Valentin Pikul is his favorite writer. I think that he was, was a favorite writer of all middle right <coughs> officers of the KGB in the 70s. Yeah? Because he's simple, it is a pulp fiction, these emperors, uh, enemies who always are foreigners or Jews, yeah? So it works. The different thing in, in Putin Russia is that it is not anti-Semitical at all. I think partly because there is not a lot of Jews, majority of them are either in Israel or in Maryland. <laughs> and the second thing is that, um, you know, it's personal. His train and Mr. Rockland and his friends are Rockland So this is the difference between, I should say, Brezhnev ideology and Putin's ideology. I actually wonder if we can use, um, so what, what Sergei is pro proposing, a difference between universality and local, you know, local forms of identity. Um, does it actually cut down all of the different, you know, cut through all the different talks? I mean, for example, Sarah was talking about privatized media, right? I mean, and the, in, a, in a sense, people are now going to local identities even for their media consumption. Um, I, uh, Corey was talking about um, about the, the, the lack of a, a large idea for the big, the big leaders who need a big idea, um, and instead they, have, they don't have these, these sort of universalizing ideas. And I wonder if even this idea of the whites having won is partly about a triumph of the local and, a, and you know, a, a sort of a sort of local identity, even of, of summer culture, summer house culture, right? Over over any kind of overarching themes. I mean, are they are, is this is this really what's happening um, everywhere? I think with the with the gulag uh, commemoration, it seems like it's impossible to be completely localized. But the question you were asking about the Paris Museum was: to what extent is what's happening there local, and to what extent is it national? So I you know I wonder if if um, if if if, um, if people would. Comment a little bit on yeah, that. You know, is, this, is this the great like dichotomy that we're looking at? Ago, there was a, uh, the Greek monument was open on the Putin of Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's really this red <laughs> idea. <laughs> it is more idea of elite, and some part of them, like Crimea, yeah, mm -hmm. are used and are popular among uh, the majority of the population, among 86% of the population. But in the same time, we have different ideas, yeah? And you mentioned it. There is a last address, and there can be a Kurgenian fence, mm -hmm. and there will be uh, local governments which usually are silent. Mm -hmm. They don't want to make choices, because Putin can tell them what is the choice. Our ideology, Putin's ideology, isn't universal. It has, uh, I don't know, pustote, uh, yeah. holes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, things were, in, in the Brezhnev time, the communist time, everything was explained. This writer is writing about the contradictions in capitalist France of the end of the 19th century. He's good. And this is bad because he's a modernist, or something like that. And uh, they put grades to everything. Putin 
easy to do. So that's why we are here. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was just wondering, I, I don't know if, if people in the audience have heard about the um, controversy surrounding the film Matilda. Uh, not Matilda, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. it sounds wrong somehow, it sounds right. like the, the other one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that actually quite fascinated me, and I was wondering, because since we had experts here, um, and, and particularly you, what is that all about? Do you want to just um, mention what the controversy oh, okay. is? I don't so, know if everyone so knows So Matilda is, well, they will know it better. It's, yep, it's but, a sort yeah. of biographical um, film about uh, Matilda Kisset? Kisset. I'll let them say it. Um, <laughs> it's hard to say, I think, even for Russians. Yes, when when Nicholas II was yeah. let the story too. not <laughs> emperor, but heir, yeah? Yeah. he was young yeah. enough. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's easier and to hear. Yeah, for you. For you. <laughs> yeah. Father and mother were very caring. <coughs> and they decided that he had to have a girlfriend. And they found him girlfriend, which was Matilda Krzysinska, a brilliant young ballet dancer in Marinsky Theatre. And they were happy three years. And then uh, Alexander III, his father, Father Nicholas II, uh, was ill and then died. And so they decided that Nicholas II had to marry somebody. And it couldn't be Krzysinska. So, so Alexander well. <laughs> uh, came from Germany, when yeah. she was Alexa from Gessen. And they become spouses. Yeah? Yeah. And they have a very, uh, very uh, loving. Uh, they were very, very loving and a very good family. Bourgeois. <laughs> mm, the main problem is the problem of 1980 when they were brutally executed with their kids in Yekaterinburg. That's why their, I should say, group of population, it's not only the Sopatlonska, which supposed that Nicholas II, as a saint of Russian Orthodox Church, couldn't be a hero of the melodrama about... A girlfriend. <laughs> a about a girlfriend. Uh, I haven't seen the movie. I hear it's not very good. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it is a okay. typical movie. <laughs> Mr. Uchitala, the director, he, he made it specially for the United States. His goal was Oscar, and probably he will receive it mm. as, a, as a best foreign oh, movie. Foreign. Yeah. Uh, it's the best costumes, the best decoration. Uh, they built uh, Uspensky Cathedral in Kremlin, <laughs> somewhere wow. on the film studio, yeah? They make thousands of uh, costumes, yeah? So, so it, is, it is a very rich film with the best Russian actors. Uh, the Polish actor is Krzysinski, the German actor is Nikos II, so on. The main problem is that and it is, it is very characteristic to Putin Russia. There was, uh, the church was against this movie. Okay. Such a crazy deputy from Crimea, Mrs. Potlotska, uh, lead the whole movement. Uh, those who <coughs> were on their, your, their side uh, put fire to the, to the movie theaters which wanted to but suddenly there was a solution that Matilda had to be in all movie theaters. And after this, Patriarch had told Matilda it was very bad. Oh. So we are in a very, very... So that was propaganda from the Patriarch that I was just saying. Yeah, it was probably a, affected me in some way that I didn't know. Yeah, no, no. I must, is, I must go no, watch it now for myself. Official point of view is that there is no censorship in Russian Federation. It's number one. Sure. So my children have to be seen, put on the screens, and nothing. It's 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 your what you have told, yeah. From one side, museum in Moscow, which were organized by Memorial, unbelievably huge. Yeah, was there. And another thing, it is uh, uh, intrigues around the Perm Museum. Mm -hmm. The Perm Museum is also not abolished. Right. Yeah, you can <coughs> see the photo of Kovalev and Vasilis Tus and all these prisoners mm -hmm. in the exposition. 
So it's not as easy. Mm -hmm. Would you give one more example uh, of this uh, controversy uh, that shows you how um, uh, interpretive communities, I guess, um, are changing the roles? <coughs> A few months ago, there was a big sort of thing in, um, in St. Petersburg when uh, suddenly there was a discussion whether to turn uh, the St. Isaac Cathedral into a church, to give it back, to, uh, not give it back, but to give it to, to the church, right? And what is interesting, of course, is that sort of, uh, it's interesting to see who would defend this position and who would, would be against this position. So uh, uh, what is called in Russia sort of liberal intelligentsia was predominantly against this. Right now we want to have sort of a museum there in the concert hall and it was the conservatives who were defending it. Like, well, no, we, can, we want to have a church. And of course, like if you, any of you watched um, um, A Man with a Movie Camera, so what you see there, one of the very first uh, scenes is when the Bolsheviks actually turn a major church into a club, right? And there are all these sort of posters demonstrating, like, well, yeah, let's con con convert it into something that it shouldn't be. So you have this strange reversal, and of course, like, sort of history legacy matters. So, like, it's lingering there. So, like, and then the reversal is not easily explainable. So why on earth would you be defending to serve like a building built for a church or kind of big events to be a museum, so on and so forth? But so there's no clear answer. No, but it always reminds us, these stories, that with Russia, there's never any one answer, right? right. Mm -hmm. That sometimes what's floating on the very surface of like, oh, there's been this you know pushback against this film, and then there's sort of a decision, well, let's just push it into all the movie theaters because the optics are better. No, yeah. because this Paklonsky crossed the red line. Oh, it is yeah. the Kremlin yeah. who, who have to make solutions. Okay. And uh, Putin doesn't like when somebody is pushing him to, well, yeah. to any side. No, he needs because to show that's a terrible idea so, so people don't so do it. So yeah. what, is, what is going on? They didn't receive order to put fire on the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. They received order to kill Nimzov, but they didn't receive order to put a fire on. See, that's why movie will be go on, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's not you who makes solutions. Because Ms. Paklonska doesn't have agency in this. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, I was trying to say. Yeah, you yeah. said it. <laughs> uh, can you, can you um, kind of respond to uh, s s some of what Stephen was uh, talking about? Yeah. Just to give you uh, like exa the, an example who, that was really striking to me recently. Uh, speaking of Memorial, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, when Crimea was annexed, Right, you know, which was a you know act of aggression. You know, it got an X. That was part of the Russian Federation. Guess what? The Russian a law uh, about uh, concerning the rehabilitation of the victims of the Stalin terror now covers that territory. And Arseniy Radinsky, the chairman of Memorial, is now sitting on you know he's sitting on the government commit commission, which is you know processing those applications. And now there are applications from Crimea. So Bragynski is now in charge of uh, dealing with that stuff. Like, and like, that's, this obviously, you know, makes a brain of a rational person explode, but this is, you know, that's, that's how things work. <laughs> you know, Bragynski, of course, you know, being, you know, an absolute person of unsurpassed integrity, mm -hmm. you know, like, by, like, as far as Russia is concerned. So that's, you know, that's how it goes. I'm sorry, I just don't hear very well, so. Uh, uh, so you talked about presence of groups dedicated to memory of Gulag on social media, mm -hmm. and you brought example uh, on like, Facebook group. So I wonder, I mean, and Facebook group, Facebook has very particular audience in Russia. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what's the difference, like, are there a lot of uh, group, groups dedicated to Gulag memory uh, on contact you? I honestly, I wish I could answer you. Um, the fact is that I don't spend my time on those sites, so I don't know as much uh, about what is available. I, I do know that, that there are um, things going on on those platforms, but I don't know how widespread they are. I mean, I'm just, you know, sort of sharing with you things that I see all the time. and. On, on Facebook, there are a number of things, but of course, in part, you know, I think you're absolutely right, it's about who the audience is there, and, and uh, a lot of what 
gets put there, um, you know, even in the Russian language, is, is by people that live somewhere outside of Russia, uh, certainly the case. But I, I just don't know the answer to the question. There is some really interesting research about what goes on on Facebook versus what goes on on Kontiakti. I haven't seen much on Adnokloskiki. Um, and it has become, you know, kind of very political in terms of where you are. Um, and I know there was a big move to Facebook uh, after the Russian government took over, made it very clear that they were going to control Contacte. Um, so um, if you were interested in that, I, I think some of the communications journals, you might find sort of a, a comparison Facebook, um, particularly with Contacte. I should say that all hipsters are <laughs> In Facebook. Facebook, because they tend to push the political <laughs> boundaries a little bit more. And I should say about this uh, bulag against war, you have to understand that it is both are minorities, Stalinists are minorities, and those who remember bulag, the, the majority isn't interested in all these cases. But that's, that's not different from other history. I think sure. one of the most interesting things about our recent history was the memorials you know, the Confederate memorials. Um, I don't want to say controversy, because some people wasn't controversial at all on both sides. But all of a sudden, family members and people who'd never just walk by, you know, statues their whole life. And we're, we're, we're post-Soviet scholars. So at some point, we've all done the whole, you know, thought about what statues mean. But most Americans never thought about it. It was just kind of there. And so to watch people actually sort of engaging with these questions of, um, I don't know who it was, uh, I think it was maybe you, Stephen, uh, talking about statues aren't about memory, they're about commemoration, which is a great line. I know I take notes incessantly here, too. Always a student, right? So, I mean, I, don't, I, I, I think sometimes, um, yeah, people, people will wake up, and they'll become historians very briefly, and sometimes badly. But that, but that, that it's, it's never that far from the surface, even in, a, in a, a, an allegedly democratic society. I think it's not only about it's history or memory, but also about politics, right? I mean, it's a political. Well, you can't, you can't separate the three, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah. In my view, or culture. Yeah. Um, although students are always like, "Oh, you're a political scientist, so you don't do history," and I'm like, well, it "Doesn't mm -hmm. really, it doesn't really work that way." I mean, I do think this is an excellent point, though, just because sort of having spent time going through newspapers myself, just looking for articles. I'm sorry. <laughs> looking, looking for articles about um, blood survivors, blood history, things of this sort, you can see a very clear sort of, uh, and, you know, and I haven't done kind of counts like you do, but a, an absolute burst of this kind of information in the late 1980s mm -hmm. up until maybe 1993, 94, and then all of a sudden it drops off and it's only, it's around October 30th every year. Mm -hmm. Or that slightly different dates in other former Soviet countries that they, they celebrate these kinds of things. But you'll see a little boost of articles every year, but for the most part, this kind of thing has, has really disappeared. I, I used to always sort of talk about it as, you know, just this feeling that there was kind of blood fatigue. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, there was a period of time in which people were so interested in something that they didn't and hadn't been able to talk about. But then all of a sudden they didn't care. They were worried about getting by in their day to day life and these kinds of things. And so, I mean, I, I do think you, no, you but, know, but in, yeah. the, in a way, it's painful. Look to the public practice to Lithuania and the, all these experience of the Holocaust. It is difficult. Uh, uh, Russians were responsible and they were victims, yeah? Mm -hmm. So they have, when they are thinking about the, that, they have to, a lot of them know that their grandfathers and grand, grandfathers were those who were on the side of the and mm -hmm. So. It, it is a dramatic thing. Well, that's like Confederates, and, and actually that's where you can kind of understand where, where people in the South, you know, they've always said, well, my pride and, you know, my great-great-great-grandfather fought in the Civil War on the side of the South, and for many generations that was okay, that's your history, that doesn't mean you're a racist or, or whatever, and in the last couple of months in the United States, like, wait a minute, you know, what's the difference between commemoration and veneration, and, and are you using this as a facade to talk about something else? So I'm finding in my life that I've become Russian in more ways than one, in the sense that um, I'm now hearing a lot of things I heard when I was studying Russia in the 1990s. 
It's a media literacy problem, you know? If only we could wake them up to <coughs> ideas of free media and democracy, everything would be fine. And I'm thinking, that didn't work in Russia, and I don't think it's going to work here. I don't think Americans are stupid. I think they're making certain choices that have consequences for democratic institutions. But they're not stupid and need to be looked at. Yeah, and then right, when, and when TV people. channels changed in the beginning of the yeah. 2000s, yes. and then TV and uh, yep. all those privatized, you couldn't say what was going on the first. The attitudes of what, who want to see the patriotic movies, mm -hmm. yeah? Well, the channels which try to get them, yeah, yeah. That those who yeah. vote for Putin want to see Putin on his vote. Or well, they are giving me that to vote for Putin. It's a road with yeah, yeah. two sides of mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think you know, the, the issue with the Confederate monuments as well as with the you know, gulag memories is that the deeper you press into these, the more you find that someone in your family tree was part of the terror network that protected slavery and, and forwarded yeah. slavery, and someone in your family tree was, was someone who drove a train or, or pulled the trigger on yeah. uh, people who were killed in the repression. Yeah. Nobody it's, wants to know about that. It's interesting to think about <coughs> Kazakhstan in this respect, because Kazakhstan does talk about this history all the time, but they always tell it in this sense that this is something the Russians did to well, us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, of course, we know that that's not really the case in Kazakhstan either, right? I mean, right. there were plenty of Kazakhs who were Every bit is involved in, uh, you know, denunciation, NKVD, working for the camps, like all of these kinds of things. But I'm, I've written another chapter on, on this kind of thing. It's going to come out in a book on museums of communism on, on some of these museums. And, and they really try to present, even the history of Karlag, which is the camp that I've written about mostly in Kazakhstan, that it is directly subordinate to Moscow. This is in the museum, and it says, and you know, none of the local administrator, you know, administration had anything to do with what was going on there. And it's really trying to <laughs> sort of. Here's our history, but it's not us. Just the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, oh, well, you know, 40 years from now, I didn't vote for Trump. You know, or 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 whatever. Um, yeah. I I think there were other narratives though emerging too. Um, I'm. In particular, I'm thinking about two examples. Uh, um, one of the um, um, members of Memorial, the name escapes me, put up um, a play called Vnuki, uh, Grandsons. And the idea was, uh, they, they interviewed um, those grandsons of people who were, and, and the, uh, who gradually discovered all this sort of information. And the play, it's sort of kind of performance, mostly in monologues, kind of narratives. Right, and the play is precisely about that, sort of what do you do? What do, you do? With this information, uh, how do you position yourself? Do you take the responsibility for this, or do you build some kind of framing around this fact? And another uh, example is a very good book by um, Yelena Racheva, uh, from a uh, journalist from um, uh, Nova Gazeta. They started. Uh, they went um, all over the um, um, uh, uh, former uh, camps or settlements, and they interviewed um, the, the victims there. But then, in the process of this book, they realized. They just couldn't do it. Uh, it just felt wrong. And as she said, I remember they started interview, interviewing the um, uh, how do we call them? Guards. Guards, guards. Yeah. right? Guards. Who, and because often the, the standard story we, we can, don't talk about that. But the standard story, of course, is that sort of often when the camps were closed, closed down, you know, these people didn't move anywhere, and they settled there. And there was a good book on Varkuta that came out a couple of years ago, right? When um, the, the, the historian, I forget the name, the historian sort of interviewed and did the history of the city, and he uh, interviewed people, the, the people who lived there, and like there are intermarriages. Guards marry sort of prisoners the other way around, and so you have these families with a really kind of palimpsestic, convoluted, completely traumatic sort of um, legacy. There is no clear strategic narrative in this way, right? So, and then, uh, so but anyhow, so Russia put together this volume uh, with uh, photographs of both sort of camps, so to speak, right? And their narratives. And when you read it, sort of, there are almost no indicators who is who. Mm -hmm. huh. And both are suffer. Both groups are suffering. So that's the major kind of narrative of kind of victimhood. See what the regime did. I think Alexeyevich's <coughs> book. Is, uh, do that too, a little, right? Like secondhand time, uh, you know, where she's. Can you start with him? No, yeah. 
Svetlana Alexandrovna. Well, no, in her case, I mean, the book is structured. Um, actually, I wrote a review on this book, so I, I, I kept to read it like, multiple times. It's interesting. It's her last book, like second hand. Uh, second hand uh, time. Uh, yeah, second hand time. Mm -hmm. What is interesting about this book is it started originally as a book of narratives of people who committed suicide. Mm -hmm. um, Successful, successful, and successfully. So it came out initially in 1993. It's a tiny, tiny book, and then she started developing it and developing it and grew and grew and grew. And so it became a book about people who were killed by the regime, basically. So I, I don't think I think it's still a successful book, but sort of that's a different story, yeah. right? Because the the strategic narrative so dominates the material that she collected. So it's can I deviate into a slightly yeah. amusing but maybe slightly off point story uh, about history? Though. Mm -hmm. So my my sister decided she would investigate the sort of, she'd do a genealogy, and she got very interested in my, I think it's my great, great grandfather, John Oates, because everyone's always named John Oates in the family. Everyone, every generation, it's very confusing. Um, and he'd come over from Ireland and he joined up the Union Army and she was interested, you know, what happened to him? Well, we have all this history on him because he mouthed off to his um, commanding officer, the commanding officer hit him with a bayonet and he spent the rest of the war in a prison camp in Florida. And we're like, yeah, he mouthed off, but definitely notes. Uh, but what's funny is, yeah, be careful what you ask for, um, and be careful how you 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 know interpret uh, history. So, I, I think that um, absolutely you can see this duality of people uh, surrounding um, um, you know monuments to Stalinist repression or against or against Stalinist repression. Uh, but I think that's something that Americans have just recently come to terms with in terms of um, trying to kind of own their past and what their past means and, and not what their, what does it mean if you're an African American and you have to walk by a statue of a Confederate soldier to get to the courthouse in Durham, North Carolina. So I find it really interesting that, that societies never stop asking these questions. And I think that um, it's just, but if you look at Russia, it's just more obvious and interesting. Other than that, but you know, which is, doesn't make life great for Russia. Let's say that it was also alleged. Uh, we don't have any monuments, or official monuments of Stalin, except the monument in Yale. There's nothing else at all. No. Not even in some small no. town tucked no. away. It's only private initiative. Right, right, private. Yeah. Uh, we we yeah. were building by the one on the Red Square by the Kremlin wall, mm -hmm. on the on the grave. That'd be hard to get oh, off. Yes, though. on the grave. Yeah. Yeah. And they took him out of the, the monument mausoleum. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. The body, yeah. A while ago, yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's important, though, I mean, that, that people have a focal point where they can go and memorialize <coughs> these heroes or villains. And, of course, every year, uh, people come and bring, you know, red flowers to that <coughs> grave, you know, and it's, it, it gets a lot of publicity. Uh, I think it's a very effective propaganda point, actually. Strong leader is better than none. Yeah, but do we know the, who are those? Who, who are those people? Well, yeah, I mean, what's the demographics? Yeah, they look like I mean, old, oh, they are old Soviets. Well, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, so it's a dying population who has like, kind of some way to, to mark their presence. They can go back to your question about agency. Right? Hmm. How serious it is. No, I, I should say that they are. A lot of young patriots. Mm, yeah. Uh, as example, Mr. Strilko yeah. in Donbass. Mm. Some of them love Stalin, some of them dislike mm. Stalin because he was a communist. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not empty, this. this yeah, but in that case, it's, it's more about power as opposed to the figure of mm. Stalin. For the generation you're talking about, it is about Stalin, period. Right. For Strilkov and then the others, it's about effectiveness and usage and so on and so forth. It's very instrumental, mm. it's not historical. I actually have a question about the avant-garde in, um, in that movie. Well, so, so, so this movie, um, which we just saw little clips from, but I think you can see it, it, it cites from, um, from Eisenstein's uh, um, Mexico fragments, I guess you could say, um, and, and, it's, and it's attacking the avant-garde as being primarily violent. But on the other hand, the structure of the film um, and the, the soundtrack, and I mean, it's it's actually really enjoying the avant-garde and appreciating the avant-garde in this in this incredible way. So those scenes you were talking about at the beginning, where we go through all of these different members of the the uh, agent brigade who are who are going to end up going to um, you know to 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 this, to this small town in Siberia. Um, we see how they have this sort of moment of truth each time in their empty room. 
Um, and, and each time it's beautiful. And then the movie actually closes with Prokofiev's um, cantata to the 20th um, anniversary of the revolution, um, which is set entirely to text by Marx, Lenin, and probably Engels, I guess, or maybe Stalin. I, I, there, there's a, but, but certainly the, the Marx, classics. right, the classics, I mean, I think it's the, it's the part of the cantata called Philosophers, oh. right, so, so, um, and it's, it's beautiful, right? Um, first, there's, a, of course, some, some, some music, I assume, native Siberian music from the, from the Kansi and the, and then the Nenets people, um, and then it switches to this cantata. So, you know, I wonder, not to mention visual references to Parajanov, to a whole bunch of different Soviet um, uh, figures. So, so it, how, it's doing something with avant-garde that's maybe not entirely, it's not entirely blaming them, or blaming them, but something else. It's complicated. Yeah. It, but it's the same thing that we are discussing now about the revolution. So mm -hmm. the, the, there is no clear sort of way to approach it, sort of because it did some things that are not, that they're not that bad, but some things were horrible. Same with avant-garde. I give you another example, sort of in Latvia. I think a few years ago, they just opened up a, you know, a huge museum of um, um, uh, Gustav Klutzes, right? And Gustav Klutzes was the person who was basically responsible for 100% uh, for creating the visual language of Soviet mm -hmm. propaganda, right? Creating all these posters with Stalin and so on and so forth. He was from uh, the detachment of Yushki um, uh, Still key, I'm a, a big uh, rifle man who basically helped to a large extent uh, to the Bolsheviks to kind of secure the revolution. He safeguarded um, uh, Lenin and so on and so forth. And then in 1937, he was killed, right? For some possible connections with, I don't know, Germans or whatever, right? So you have his museum in Latvia where so there is a clear anti communist and anti sort of Soviet stance. Yeah, that was one of the very few major um, um, avant garde sort of. Um, um, artists that they have. What do you do with this? What do you do with this? How do you, and they publish beautiful um, 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 catalogs where Kalutis, like in, uh, which is kind of interesting, so like he writes in, in, in uh, they, they published uh, facsimiles of, of his articles, but the translations are only in Latvian and uh, with the printed uh, in uh, Latvian and English, right? So, and all the articles say about propaganda and the importance of the montage for the purposes of Soviet propaganda. Right, so, and then that's what I think the Dorshinka is trying kind of to negotiate and he fails, like there is a fascination with the form. But what happens to Russian avant-garde when we take the, uh, this communist ideological yeah. kind of content mm -hmm. out? Like it, it falls apart. It's like well, flying dogs right. with, with wings made out of pretzels. Right, it, 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 it becomes yeah. ridiculous, right? And it's the same thing I'm sort of writing now about Lisitsky. It's, it's amazing, so the, guards, uh, the guy started as a sort of major avant-garde sort of artist working with Malevich and, and whatnot, like creating this non-figurative art, and it's really pioneering, so a lot of uh, world, uh, world avant-garde, Western avant-garde, was influenced by Lisitsky, and then he becomes basically a hack worker mm. for the regime, producing all these you know, beautiful albums about Soviet industry, industry, Soviet food industry, or like Soviet subtropics, and that kind of stuff, like where it's all about sort of, you know, how many galoshes that the, the government has produced, that sort of stuff, right? So what do you do with this? And the answer is like, well, you have people with multiple sort of biographical stages, and you know, you, you pick what you want, I guess. I don't know, I, you know. But there is a fascination, yeah, I think you're right, so look in this I mean, even if you, well, you know, if you're happening to look for images from the avant-garde and you go, do a Google image search, you will find so many posters for cafes and things like that that are done in the exact right. style of 1920s artists, right? But then, so there's, it's, yeah. it's just a sort of fetishization, maybe, that's yeah. not, right? Yeah. Uh, you know? But on the other hand, like, we know what the, um, the, the American art history did to that. It's precisely, I mean, avant-garde is all over the place, but it, it's read and analyzed entirely a historical as sort of a history of forms, not as a history of social context, motivation, so on and so forth. But for the same, the, the political is just taking For exactly the same reason, right. yeah. So it's not a Gitmer God anymore, it's just artistic collectives. Well, it's art, it's art disconnected from its ideological meaning, mm -hmm. which, is, which is exactly what the Soviets told us not to do, right? But it's exactly what's happening now, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. But I, I was just thinking, because I was in Kiev last year and they had a Malevich. Well, they claim to have a Malevich exhibition, have one Malevich, so it's a little bitter. <laughs> but, uh, but it's also funny because it's like the last thing you think a country being invaded by Russia might have at that exact moment in time. But there you go. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think it's. I've been thinking a lot about the question you asked initially, which is this are we, I guess, devolving into, into local sort of issues and losing sight of a meta narrative? And I think the problem is, to a degree, we're not. But we're just hooking on to meta narratives that don't seem moored in reality. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you're, you're, uh, Corey, you were talking about, you know, Khrushchev and, and Kennedy had a, a meta narrative or an ideology or an orientation, almost a religion of what, you know, the, there was no end of history to them. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, this is, um, I, I am part of something that is greater than myself. And I don't think Trump has that narrative, really. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think maybe his administration does and, and, and tries to build that. He constantly undermines them with different political messaging. I think Putin's more successful at that, and, I, and I'd be interested to, to know what people more intimately familiar with Putin's efficacy as a First national of all, I leader. I want to tell you that Khrushchev was displaced not because he was severe in the Cuban crisis, but because he organized the Cuban crisis. Ah. Yes, yeah, so they were seen as a mistake. They were yeah. much more frightened by Cuban crisis than himself. He was a really, I, I, I have a lecture about uh, the murder of Stalin. Yeah? He was a real brave man and very risky, and they were frightened by it. Brezhnev was much more moderate than. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it is difficult to, to compare Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin. They are very different, I should say. It'd be a great book, though. They both are artists, but they are playing in, in different performances. <laughs> you can imagine one performance. Well, there is such performance in Earth, the globe. Yeah. <laughs> they are playing on, on this stage. But Putin uh, is uh, a man who will think 25 times before he will pronounce something. Yes, he is absolute, he is reactive, he, he is quick. It is a school of uh, backyard. So if you assault him, he will assault back, it's true. But in the beginning, in, in all his steps, he makes them very, very careful. He will also wait to get revenge, I think. I think he's very smart that way. Um, and that's why people often fear him. He doesn't forget things. Yeah, sure. You know, <coughs> Stalin, there is, a, there is a, I don't know, it is any road or it is, it is, in reality, it is in Trotsky that several members of Politburo gather together and uh, they discuss you know, what is uh, the joy of the you know, the happiness. Yeah. Yeah. And Bukharin said that happiness is to cling to the mountain because he was an alpinist. And uh, I don't know, uh, Zinoyev has said that happiness is to see the socialist revolution in the United States of America. <laughs> and uh, Stalin had told that the happiness is to be assaulted, assaulted. Interesting. To be what? Be assaulted. <laughs> assaulted. Yes, yeah. and, and to wait. Oh, <laughs> and to get revenge. And when yeah. the time comes to, 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 to have a revenge. And then to go and sleep. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're tired. Very <laughs> in this sense, Putin is very close to Stalin. We were taught in school that Stalin was killed and this is a very American view, right? He was killed because people were like, well, he's killing everyone, he's gonna to get to me pretty soon. So they just kind of got together and got rid of him. And that's, which no, you can see is a very... I'm sure the Stalin was killed. There is no, no he, he couldn't be not killed because if, if uh, old man and insult is laying on the urinated, is laying on the floor, and 24 hours there is no physicians, oh. it means that he, he was killed. I think that he was poisoned. And it was not the population. Yeah? It was, we know the name of those who killed him. It is Mr. Beer, Mr. Milenkov, Mr. Khrushchev, and Mr. Bulgari. And probably General Khrustalov uh, was the man who poisoned the glass. Have you seen this movie, Khrustalov Masha? No, I'm not, but I should. Mm -hmm. Well, getting back to Putin, I think uh, the difference between Putin and Trump is Putin has now had 18 years in power to evolve. You know, yeah. And if you look at his the beginning of his his presidency, yeah, look at the curse, he's a disaster, far for example, curse. which he didn't you know, handle well. Far more yeah. cautious, less colorful, less. He doesn't know how to project power yet. And now I think the the man we see today knows very well how to project power. Well, he has his networks as well, and I yeah. think I think, but I don't. I don't. I no, I just wanted to say, just to react yeah. to Corey, just well, like, we'll how much more color or or colorful do you expect things to get in eight years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, you know, 
No, that's, 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 yeah. Because, I, you know, I, it feels quite saturated. Well, we don't, we yes. see, see, yeah, that, I'm a political yeah. communication scholar, so I, I don't think we know. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. it's it's like all those people used to run around and say, "Oh, well, you just keep <coughs> Putin there, be democracy in Russia," and people don't say that so often. But you know, you you heard that, right? Or or the problem is Putin, and, uh, and I'm like, it's not one person. You know, it is. It's a whole system and <coughs> institutions. And I think now Americans are all running around, liberal Americans, and you know they want to see them. Just turn on CNN. What can we do to get rid of Trump? And like that's not really the question here for a long list of reasons. The question is how did we come to this point, point? and what does this mean? Um, but that isn't really going to fit. You know, how do we come to this point? And what does it mean? It doesn't look good on a scroll scrolling thing on the bottom of CNN. So, what what do you do? But we could learn so much from, you know, the Russian experience. Of course, I would say that because I've studied it, right? Whatever. But um, it does it does strike me that sometimes I hear things and I think, oh, ooh, I think there's someone in the back. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. What you just said reminded me of something that uh, I was forwarded by I think my friend working in Common Cause, where uh, it's something that the, that the Democratic National Committee had done, where they took a photograph from a protest where somebody's holding a sign that says, "Trump, Trump is the symptom, capitalism is the disease." And they had like somebody, they had somebody Photoshop it, so it just says, "Trump is the symptom," blank, <laughs> like, totally, you know, removing from context. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's challenging. <coughs> then going back to um, the differences and similarities between Putin and um, and Trump, and thinking about similarities and um, your initial question about. Um, strategic narratives, to me, um, it looks like sort of the narrative they both share, or rather not that personal, I don't know that personal, <coughs> but I think the cultures at the moment, it's the narrative of conspiracy as an organizing framework. And that goes back to the question about the symptom. We, we don't need to know what it is the symptom of. We know that it is a symptom, namely, sort of the meaning is not directly available, we only know its effects, and sort of like, and you're trying to reconstruct the the framework by looking at the symptoms because you don't have access to the core of the problem. So we have in both cases this very strong desire sort of to look for those connections between things that are among things that might not be connected. Yeah, yeah. Because <coughs> a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to what extent, let me hear from anybody out there, to what extent is this simply becoming after the end of the Cold War, just simply a challenge to American exceptionalism, American <coughs> military hegemony in the world, uh, that we won the Cold War, that we promised the Russian Federation that we weren't going to expand NATO, and that's all we've been doing, is NATO's been expanding. And I can understand why Poland wants to join NATO. It's not necessarily to contribute to NATO. It's that my neighbor, I have such a turbulent history of my neighbor to the east. Um, and when, when and I've served in the U.S. military, so I'm I am a patriot, and I'm but I'm also somewhat of a Russophile. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I maybe combined. maybe as American, you know, those of us that are experts, maybe we understand Russia a little bit better than the average person too. We understand why things are happening, but comments. So you were about to say who made that? Problem. Excuse me. Who made the promises that Poland would be? I think there were some. 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 No, never ever. There were never any agreements? No. Right. Gorbachev has said that. Yeah. Uh, and what, what would you, will you do with Poland, Czechia, or Hungary? They want to be members of an overlanding treaty organization. How can you can stop it? Yeah. I know if it's something maybe that doesn't have an answer. There's not a yes or no. no they, uh, in, in, in Bucharest, uh, they promised that if Ukraine will give its nuclear weapons, it will be neutral. It would be member, wouldn't be member of North Atlantic Region, and Ukraine isn't and wouldn't. So I shouldn't say that there was some. It is, a, it is a, what you have mentioned. It's the idea of conspiracy. Mm -hmm. I think that Putin suppose from his own logic that there were such promises, not pronounced. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we have ruined our great state, that's why, 
you have to give us some concessions. But it not, never happened. It, it couldn't happen. But what he articulates is, I think a lot of people do believe that. So I think it's an interesting piece of, of evidence and actually very helpful for my narrative study, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think your idea of um, the narrative of conspiracy, that would be a great article title, so appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You'll get no credit, maybe a footnote. But, <laughs> <laughs> but also, going back to your question about um, exceptionalism, I think there would be a few problems if this exceptionalism actually worked. But there are many examples when it didn't, say in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in many other sort of places. And so when you see it crumbling, yet at the same time you see uh, the insistence on the responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. right? So it's not clearly the ideology is not working or the ideology is not matched by the things on the ground, right? So then you start questioning the pretense. Right. And I think that's what is happening. And going back to the uh, question that we, we've discussed already, there are no meta narratives, and the ones that are are not working. But there is no clear sort of place where you go and get it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we are in a post meta narrative kind of situation now, right? So we've got kind of to be dealing with this local, you know, events and things. Mm -hmm. I think large, largely, to me, it, that's the problem. But people still believe this. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, you could have all kinds of fictions and sort of fantasies and yeah. escapist uh, and, you know, uh, flights, right, yeah, but it's not, I mean, Afghanistan is a good example. It's an exact sort of consequence of this exceptionalism and sort of responsibility to protect understood largely, right, and so on, and, 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 and but more importantly, with Afghanistan, we've seen sort of a previous version of that, but from the Soviet part, didn't work either. But it was motivated exactly by the same exceptionalist and triumphalist sort of idea. We could help these people to do to stage a revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, if, if I may say something, uh, it's, you know, I don't pretend to be able to psychoanalyze Putin, but one thing is, you know, very clear uh, about him and people uh, of his sort. He fundamentally doesn't believe in uh, in moral, uh, you know, moral motives for political choices. He just it just doesn't uh, morality doesn't doesn't come into, into into his into his calculations. And he uh, uh, he is deep, deeply skeptical about you know anybody else, you know, any kind of outside. Uh, 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 entity uh, bringing it up as a motivation, of, and of course, like at least, you know, historically American uh, politics had this kind of, uh, at least, you know, superficially, you know, the argument can, can be made whether it's real, implied or real, or, but we, uh, you know, talk about our polity as a moral uh, entity, <coughs> and he just like. He's a, he's a thug. He does just it's like his reaction to this is, uh, and it's if I make any sense. Yeah. No, his moral side is that he trusts friends. He trusts friends. You know, yeah. Trump. Yeah. It's local. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's very local. Very local. local. Yeah. Family structure. Gets back to Elizabeth's point. Yes. Well, he gets he's like you know, he's like, yeah. It's uh, he is uh, you know, it's like you know, it's. You know, going back to Stephen, you know, the, the, the memory of, say, the memory of the Shore, or the memory of the Gulag, uh, or Putin's memory of the siege, Blakada, because mm -hmm. he had a brother who died in the siege. You know, that's, you know, this is sacred. You don't touch that. This is, but I, I, you know, I have it in my bones, right? And uh, uh, despite what people in this room may, uh, like, perceive um, uh, from the outside looking in, the most, uh, uh, the part of the uh, Soviet terror that is most remembered in Russia is not 1937. It's not the Great uh, Purge, right? It's the, of course, it's the early 1930s is the collectivization. Because, as uh, Lev has said, it was an 85% uh, peasant country. <coughs> and every other person's ancestor was a peasant. And this is what people remember, you know, my grandfather, my great grandfather, you know, they, you know, they've been sent to here and there in Krasnoyarsk, and this is where my father was born. While, you know, the plight of Tukhachevsky and Lyrafold, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you feel it personally as as you, Sarah, are saying, right? This is this is what happened to me, to my family. Right. You know, this is the ditch, you know, in which you know members of my, you know, Mishikashima family tree, you know, are lying and you know coming against Kadoshi since 1941. So that's yeah, and it's tough, you know, because you know, a white family's history as opposed to an African American family's history, you know, it's one. I think there's there's some Russian phrase I can't remember. It's 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 crap or, or not a sin, but it's it's one horrible grief, you know, as opposed to oh, this person had to serve, you know, and fought in these battles. So yeah, it's like collectivization versus political. Um, Persecution. And uh, also, I want to remind you that uh, Russia lost 27 million people, in, people in the Second World War. Yeah. And I couldn't say only, but 700,000 in 1937. And much more in the time of civilization. Everything is painful. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, are there any more questions from the audience? Yeah, we have one. Everything is painful, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect conclusion. Yeah. Everything is painful. It's a perfect motto for our times. Yeah. Well, well, I am very glad that we have such interesting conversation. And I think that the bottom line is that everything in Russia is much more complicated and couldn't be simplified. I think the same is true about America, but we tend to simplify it. You know, that's my more <laughs> Well, thank you very much to our panelists and to the audience for coming. Um, there's still food, so please um, feel free to eat more food or take it with you if you're uh, if you live nearby. Um, and thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.